The appearance at Woodstock for Nine Inch Nails displayed their talents in music to a massive audience and confirmed their status as the most widely recognized industrial act around. However, by that time, their music and performances were drawing criticism from other members of the industrial scene. Trent did run into some criticism um, 1994 and forward because I th well, he, got, he got very successful, he sold a lot of records. And this, in the eyes of some people, meant that he had broken away from the traditional dogma of what it meant to be an industrial artist. Up until that point, you had to play mostly synthesizers, and if you could get away with you know, banging two pipes together instead of playing actual drums, uh, so, so much better. So the old school fans of the Skinny Puppy and the mid-80s ministry and the, uh, the Belgian bands, um, you know, the front 242s of the world, began to question you know, Trent's motives. Has he sold out? I mean, by the mid-90s, industrial music was, was more or less washed up. Um, ministry were going through one of the most despondent phases, you know, thanks to Al's much publicized drug problems. Um, Skinny Puppy were you know, more or less finished, you know, they had, what, you know, a founder member was dead and, um, you know, bands like Frontline Assembly had really gone off into a sort of more of an ambient techno direction. Front 242 had, 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 had done similar. Um, and the, although there was an underground of, of European bands, they were really just repeating things that had gone, gone on before 10 years old. Um, a lot of the ideas sort of like lived on in, in techno and in, in alt rock and in metal, but um, you know I don't think there was anybody that was desperate to, to go out and you know sort of listen to um, a band that sounded exactly like you know Ministry sort of circa 1988 anymore, um, and it, you know obviously the downward spiral was Trent, Trent's kind of farewell to it all. I mean, it was certainly not a, an industrial album, and I don't think there was any expectation that that was the, the direction that he was going to continue in. The direction that Trent was heading in was to take some time out from the public eye. The downward spiral, along with the self-destruct tour and Woodstock performance, had propelled Nine Inch Nails into the mainstream, and other acts were breaking through to follow in their wake. A Resna protege, Marilyn Manson, would go on to gain similar levels of success, and other acts such as Stabbing Westwood and Richard Patrick's Filter would also come to the fore. The success of the downward spiral had been massive, and that success was to take its toll on Resna and the band. It would be five years until the next Nine Inch Nails album. One of the things a successful album will buy you is time, and Trent was not looking to make another downward spiral. So he knew that he could buy as much time as he needed to create his, his next record. At the same time, he had nothing records. He had, his, he had been relocated to, um, to New Orleans. He had his house, he had his recording studio. He had his work with Manson and other bands. So he was you know, quite occupied. He went through a period of uh, probably writer's block, but then it all broke down and he ended up with a double album. The problem was he was also spiraling down into drug abuse and alcoholism. And when the album came out, um, you know, he thought it was the best he could do. He looks back on the Fragile thinking, you know what, it's a double album. If I had made that a single album, if I had the, the guts and the discipline to make that a single album, it would have been a, a much better record. Um, so the answer to the question is he was really busy between the end of the tour for the Downward Spiral and the release date in September of 1999 for Fragile, and not all of it was happy, happy time. Repeatedly delayed and hugely anticipated, The Fragile, released in September 1999, was a double album of material that included both songs and instrumental pieces, and on release went straight to the top of the charts. All the insides left cold and gray There is a Fragile was huge. It debuted number one, I believe. And again, um, it was another evolution in Nine Inch Nails in the sense that he went he, he went back to kind of a, a groove element. He, he's back to more uh, a, a song structure in, in his music. But at the same time, he was, he was also not very clear as to what he was trying to to speak about and sing about as evidenced by the fact that he had two albums of music he might have had writer's block but 
there's there's two kinds of writer's block. There's writer's block in the sense that you can't do any writing, and then there's writer's block where you just keep coming up with stuff, but nothing's really catching on. We wanted to do something that was unique, something that no one had heard before. Certainly, he had ambitions beyond simple rock and roll, beyond industrial music, beyond punk, beyond rock. I really don't think that uh, Trent Reznor wanted to write pop songs at that time in his career. I think he had discovered everything that he could about pop music and, you know, popularity. And I think he really wanted to kind of wrestle with himself and uh, find out what is driving him within, what, you know, what kind of music he really kind of can, can create when he doesn't specifically have pop uh, ambitions in mind. It's not as big a change as, the, as it was between Pretty Hate Machine and The Downward Spiral, but it is a change from The Downward Spiral. It is something that it is looking at more subtle electronic sounds more than ever before. It has the expected snarling guitars it, in many cases. It has the extreme lyrics. It has the, uh, it has the aggressive beats. It doesn't have them as often. It doesn't have them as much. He's basically saying... I would like to explore this now, please, and taking this particular course. And the fact that he did so, and the fact that he was able to still actually release a massive hit album and get some big singles off of it, is a testimony to the fact that he knows, again, how not to create something that's completely insular. If he had done something that was just nothing but sound textures at, at that time, everyone would just wonder what had happened to him. It's hard to tell if The Fragile was uh, an intentional effort by uh, Trent Reznor to... Uh, you know, get away from that mainstream popularity and to, to get away from his core sound, um, or if it's just kind of what was swimming around in his head at the time and, and what came out. Only he knows that, but obviously the album didn't have the same impact with, uh, with, with his audiences. There really wasn't anything that was blatantly commercial on the record. And then the most commercial song, Starfuckers Incorporated, you know, is, is kind of catchy, is kind of... Um, you know, heavy in, in, in the way that some of his previous music had been, but it has a, a chorus you can't put on the radio. competing theories regarding what Starfuckers Incorporated is about. The first is that it's a big fuck you to the alternative scene that had grown up uh, in the last couple of years and that you know people were getting into it for the scene because it was the thing to do because it was what the cool kids were doing. Much like Kurt Cobain got very upset when you know the frat boys started getting into Nirvana. Um, he didn't want frat boys, he wanted punk rockers. Trent wanted his fans. He wanted the industrial kids who understood what he was talking about being his fans. He didn't want the trendoids, you know, coming to his shows and ruining, you know, what he was trying to and misinterpreting what he was all about. The second theory about Starfuckers Incorporated is that it's very much like what Carly Simon apparently did to either Warren Beatty or Mick Jagger in You're So Vain back in the early 1970s. It's a message to Manson who was feuding with Trent. So I guess your interpretation of what the song is actually about depends on your position regarding Marilyn Manson and the relationship he had with Trent Reznor by mid-1997. Despite the high anticipation and top spot opening in the charts, the Fragile quickly slipped out of the top ten within the first week forcing Reznor to finance the band's resulting tour out of his own pocket. Trent once again retreated, and there was to be another extended hiatus between Nine Inch Nails albums, brought on by Trent's battle with addiction. In 2005, Reznor was back. He had beaten the drink and drugs and looked refreshed and healthy, and as a display of strength, released his fifth official studio album, With Teeth. With Teeth is quite a step in Nine Inch Nails' um, career. Uh, again, six years between The Fragile and With Teeth. And during that time, uh, Trent Reznor really went out of his way to clean up, to, to just get rid of the demons, to abolish that which had been destroying him for so long. With Teeth really has that sound of 
him waking up out of that. In a way, it was the closest thing to Pretty Hate Machine that he had done yet. It was certainly the most, you could argue, formal presentation compared to the fragmented concept album approach of Downward Spiral and very much compared to the huge sprawl of The Fragile. This is a case of sort of like, okay, here is a relatively concise set of songs, fairly discreet, connected to each other, but certainly not a concept album. He initially was going to do another sort of concept album, and then he said, now this will be more like a collection of songs with sort of certain thematic connections, but that's about it. I think at that time, I mean, you know, various things had happened, um, such as, you know, he'd moved from New Orleans back to Los Angeles. Um, he had basically kicked drinking drugs. Um, he had, you know, he was, he was never going to be a happy camper, but he was probably less of a self-obsessed, you know, um, existential dilemma artist than he had been at any point previous to that in his career. Looking outside himself, with Teeth's first single, The Hand That Feeds, referred heavily to the Bush presidency and carried a sentiment of old industrial, railing against the people in power. Nine Inch Nails excels really when Trent Reznor is writing songs about uh, his own experience, his own turmoil, his own drama. Uh, I think on With Teeth, he really wanted to reach outside of himself and, and kind of not open himself up to the public so much. And I think that the songs you know, really lack a certain uh, uh, visceral quality uh, because of it. I think they uh, come off as uh, a little bit uh, watered down. I think the album on a whole really kind of sounds like he's trying to do what he does but is not really feeling it the way he used to. One of the significant things is that there are many more collaborators involved. I don't think he would perhaps have been as open to collaborations on the downward spiral or the fragile simply because he was, well, he was at the top of his game, but he was at the top of his game of being Trent Reznor. Now he didn't really have anything to prove. So yeah, I mean, he was, he was reaching out. And of course he was, he's still an important figure. He's still a hugely important figure in alternative, alternative music, whatever you want to call it, rock and roll. But he was very much reaching out to other musicians and other people, um, which he hadn't really been doing before. His collaborators were his collaborators, and it was a, it was a close inner circle. The record topped the US album chart, and although it received mostly positive reviews pointing at a return to form, some were not so impressed. When With Teeth came out, I think there was a big, huge, collective sigh amongst all Nine Inch Nails fans that went, oh, thank God, we've been waiting really since 1994 for a proper Trent Reznor album, for a proper Nine Inch Nails album. I mean, we liked The Fragile, but we needed another album like The Downward Spiral. We needed another album like Pretty Hate Machine, and With Teeth was the closest we we, we got. And considering all the things that had been happening, all the rumors that we had been hearing, and all the stories that had been coming out about Trent's personal life, just to have this record with, you know, these solid songs on it, I was like, okay, things are back to normal, it's going to be all right. Commercially, it was, it was very successful. It, I mean, uh, the, uh, the hand that feeds all over the radio, it's still being played all the time. Um, but I think that it's it's a huge departure from even uh, from everything that Nine Inch Nails did. Whether it, you want to discuss the idea of the industrial sound, or you want to talk about the darkness, it's really it's almost a it's almost a a mainstream sound. He he's not really trying. It does it doesn't sound like he's trying to push the envelope of experimentation with this album as much as he has had in the past. I think it's really an album that 
isn't Trent at his, at his uh, strongest. I think he's treading water a little bit. And I think you can hear that there's uh, a little of that uh, desire to return to sort of the past industrial, uh, you know, uh, angst and uh, uh, some of that volatility. Um, and at the same time, um, there's, there's uh, the desire to kind of continue in this new experimental direction. And you kind of land in a midway point. It doesn't feel like he really has his feet grounded in, in a sense of where he wants to be. One thing about with Teeth is that we have individual songs. Uh, it's track after track after track. Now that could be because of the way the songs were written over a long period of time and they had to be sequenced in a certain order and it just made sense to have each one of them separate. Or it could be that Trent had begun to figure out that uh, music fans are consuming songs a la carte. They weren't necessarily going to listen to an album front to back like they used to in the old vinyl days. Uh, iTunes and the iPod had come along by this time and people were listening to whatever songs they wanted in whatever order they wanted. So maybe he was just embracing the new technology, embracing the new consumer behavior of a la carte music. This release was actually uh, a departure in other ways for the fans because this was the first album that uh, Res uh, Trent Reznor released it as multi-track recordings. He, he opened up the, the album to his fans and said, you know what, you don't like the album, make your own. And no one had ever really done that, and nobody in the mainstream anyway. I mean, maybe there were some underground artists in the past and at that time that were doing that, but this was, this was the beginning of Trent Reznor branching out into completely new directions beyond just music. <laughs> 